Thank you very much for joining us tonight, everyone, and welcome to Politics in the Pub. We love to see you all here. Uh, can we get the, the music turned down? Thank you. We're just going to work on getting that music turned down, sorry. Uh, thank you so much for coming along tonight. We really love these Politics in the Pub events and it's nice to be all back in person as well. Uh, I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet tonight, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to Elders past and present, and extend that respect to any Aboriginal people in the audience here tonight, and ask us all to reflect on what we can do to support the campaign to have a First Nations voice enshrined in the Constitution as that campaign heats up. Before we dive into this evening's events, uh, I want to remind you that the Australia Institute is holding a revenue summit in Parliament House on the 6th of October. It will feature speakers including Rod Sims, former chair of the ACCC, Sally McManus, secretary of the ACTU, ACT Chief Minister Andrew Barr, as well as tax experts like Professor Miranda Stewart, people you know and love like Dr Richard Dennis, who's also here tonight, and crossbench members including Senator Barbara Pocock, independent senators, uh, sorry, independent MPs, Zoe Daniel, Allegra Spender and Di Lee. Early bird tickets are on sale now. You can head on over to australiainstitute.org.au to buy those tickets today and save $50. So we love hosting politics in the pub. We believe that an informed and engaged community helps drive better politics. That's something I think we'll be diving into a lot tonight. It's very much on topic. Um, we do have, uh, always try and put these on uh, events on for free, but they're not free to host. So if you can chip in tonight with a donation, we've got a donations box towards the back and a tap and go uh, donation at the bar as well. Don't forget you can get a drink from the bar or food from below afterwards because this venue this evening, Verity Lane Market, uh, is one of our favourites. It's a top venue, so please support it if you can. And I am delighted to introduce our guest tonight, uh, our local MP, I'm sure for many of you here this evening, uh, Andrew Lee. He's the Assistant Minister for Competition, Charities and Treasury, a former Professor of Economics, and he's also a prolific author of almost too many books to list here tonight, so I'll only mention two of them. Uh, Reconnected, a community builder's handbook, which I think we'll probably dive into a lot this evening. And I know he has a new book coming out next week, I believe, Fair Game. Lessons from Sport for a Fairer Society and a Stronger, uh, and a stronger Economy. Uh, please give Andrew Lee a big hand for joining us this evening. Thank you so much, Andrew. He's just going to say uh, a few words to begin with and then we'll move into the, the Q&A portion of the evening. Thank you, Andrew. Lovely. Well, thank you so much, uh, Ebony, and thanks to the Australia Institute for putting on tonight's event. I have missed being in a pub with real human beings for the last two years. Uh, so it's such a pleasure to be in a room with a bunch of uh, friends, progressive activists, great Canberrans, contributing to what, as Ebony said, is, is the, the, the stuff of politics. Being able to shape the world through ideas and having a Labor government at the federal level that's willing to listen to your ideas. Uh, can I thank the Australia Institute, which has just been a, a remarkable contributor to the public policy debate over many years. Uh, the work that Ben, Richard and many others do is just so critical to shaping the uh, progressive debate in Australia. Uh, I want to talk tonight about an issue which uh, I hope will be, you will think of as more important by the time I've finished than at the beginning, which is the strength of community in Australia. I want to run you through some of the uh, markers of what's happened to community in Australia and then argue why you should care about it. I'm going to just make the assumption that everyone in the room is a social democrat, progressive. So I'm going to make the case that progressives should care about social capital. So social capital is the notion that the connections between us have an inherent value. Uh, just as physical capital, bridges or roads or cars have a value, just as human capital, education and skills has a value, 
Social capital is the notion that the, the networks of trust and reciprocity, uh, those community ties, have an inherent value. And if you believe that, then you should be worried about some of the trends that we've seen in Australia over the last generation or two. And let me through, run you through a few of those. Let's start off just with the sheer number of associations in Australia. The Directory of Australian Associations has been keeping tabs on the number of associations and you can calculate the number of groups per 100,000 adults. You go back to 1980, we had around 100 groups per 100,000 adults. And now that number is down to less than 20. We've lost four-fifths of the Australian associations on a per-person basis. There's just fewer groups for people to join. Then we can look at people's propensity to join existing groups. One way of doing that is to look at the big established groups that have kept membership records over many decades. When we wrote Reconnected, Nick Terrell and I contacted some of the biggest ones. Think Scouts, Guides, Rotary, Lions, RSL. Uh, and we asked them for their membership records going back as far as they could give them to us. And then we built a, a big index looking at how their membership had changed. I go like this because that's basically what happens to the trends. You see a, a surge in membership in those post-war decades, 1940s, 1950s, through to the 1960s. Australians were joining up these big mass membership organisations. I remember my late grandfather, Rolly Stebbins, talking about that period after the shooting stopped in 1945, in which Australians were out joining and, as he said, doing a fair bit of partying as well. Many of the big Australian organisations were formed in those decades, in the 1950s and 1960s. But then something happened, and around 1970s, we began to see a decline. And now membership of those big mass organisations is down to just about a third of what it was in the 1970s. It's not just that we've quit those big organisations and join smaller ones. It actually turns out that if you survey Australians and you say, are you a member of any organisation, they're less likely to say yes than they were in the past. The Bureau of Statistics has been surveying people and asking about membership of social groups, sporting groups and political groups, and all of those have waned. I've seen that myself in the organisation I've been most involved with, the Australian Labor Party, which had a much larger share of the population in the 1950s than it does today. We've also seen a drop in volunteering. Uh, volunteering rates, and uh, as recently as 2010, were around 35%. COVID hit them hard and took them down to 25%, and volunteering's barely recovered. On the latest ANU survey, just 26% of Australians were volunteering. Uh, so we've seen about a third of our volunteers drop out just over the course of the last decade. The Productivity Commission too has been tracking one particular category of volunteers, that's volunteer firefighters. And it turns out that the share of adults who signed up to be volunteer firefighters was steadily dropping over the last decade. No wonder when those black uh, summer bushfires hit in 2019-2020, that we found Australian volunteers feeling as burned out as the bush around them. Uh, increasingly, people had been failing to join the volunteer bushfire fighting brigades and left those, that group of volunteers more stretched than ever. We've also seen a drop in philanthropic giving. You can look at this two ways. You can look at the tax deduction data from the Australian Tax Office that gives us a nice long time series, but it doesn't capture all of the giving. Or you can look at the Australian Bureau of Statistics surveys, which ask, have you given money to charity lately? Uh, it's more recent, more accurate, but it doesn't give you as long a time span. Anyhow, both of the series point in the same direction. Australia, the share of Australians who give to charity has been falling significantly uh, over the course of the last couple of decades. Curiously, the total number of dollars has held up, uh, and that's largely because we've got far more billionaires than we did before, and one of the things billionaires tend to do is to give to charity. So charitable giving has become increasingly an elite sport rather than a mass participation activity. 
the share of Australians who are philanthropists have fallen. Speaking of sport, Roy Morgan allows us to track sporting participation going back over two decades. And that shows a huge drop in the share of Australians participating in many organised sports. Netball is down. Uh, AFL is down. Cricket is down massively. Uh, golf has gone through the floor. Australians are switching away from team sports and moving towards individual activities. More of us are likely to be going for a walk. More of, it, more of us go to the gym. Uh, but they tend to be individual activities. Uh, and yes, just in case you're a fan of Robert Putnam, uh, bowling is down. Uh, Australians are uh, not bowling in leagues, and less of them are even bowling alone. Uh, there are fewer Australians involved in, in many of these team sports. We've also seen a drop in another form of community organisation, which is religious participation. At the end of World War II, about half of Australians attended a religious service monthly or more often. And now that's down to just one in seven. We can debate the theological uh, implications of that, and I see there's some, some views about that. <laughs> but one of the things it's done is to, to hit the strength of community. Those who attend religious services are more likely to give money, to, even if you exclude their religious giving. Those who attend religious services are more likely to volunteer, even if you exclude their religious volunteering. This is nothing about their beliefs. Believers are not, by virtue of belief, more likely to be involved in the community. It's attendees who are more likely to get, get engaged. That's because the main reason that people give and volunteer is that someone asked them. And attending a religious service puts you in contact with other people who are more likely to do, ask you to do something like, for example, to give blood. We've also seen a fall in trade union membership, and I hope there's no applause for that one. Uh, we've, uh, we've seen since the early 1980s a drop in the union membership for about half the workforce to about a seventh of the workforce. That's got industrial implications because workers are, uh, unions are of course the organisation that uh, uh, brought you the weekend and four weeks of annual leave. But it's also got community implications because unions play a key role in introducing a new worker around to their co-workers or organising a lunchtime barbecue. With a decline in unions, there's been a decline in a, in a bit of that civic glue, a bit of that community spirit in the workplace. And I think that's a problem. And we've seen a decline in informal socialising. Nick Terrell and I, for Reconnected, found a survey that had been asked in 1984 that asked people, how many friends do you have who you could trust with a confidence? In and then we said, asked survey researchers to ask those again, uh, we did that in 2005 and again in 2018. And we saw a significant decline in the average number of friends that the average Australian had. In the mid-80s, the average Australian said they had nine close friends. Today, the average Australian says they've got five close friends. So we've shed about half of our close friends. The survey in 1984 also asked, how many people are there living around here who you could drop in on, uninvited, without asking for an invitation. 1984, people said, oh, there's about 11 people around here I could drop in on uninvited. And now, a typical person says, more like five people they could drop in on uninvited. So in the period since the TV show Neighbours has been on the screens, we've lost about half, the, half of the neighbours that we know in real life. Australians are less likely to have close friends and less likely to know our neighbours. And the final metric, which strikes me uh, pretty starkly. Following uh, work by Robert Putnam in his new book, The Upswing, we looked at Australian books and the words used in Australian books. Google's engrams allows you to do this beautifully. They've scanned uh, thousands and thousands of Australian books, fiction, non-fiction. And so for each decade, going back 100 years, we can ask the question, how often do those books use the collective words, we and us, and how often do they use the individualistic words, I and me? And we can build a ratio of the two, a, a we to me index, if you like. That we to me index, it's pretty stable from 1900s right through the 1970s. And then in the 1980s, it starts to drop and drop and drop. Australian books are becoming less collectivist and more individualistic. 
uh, less communitarian, a little bit more Ayn Rand. Uh, our books are telling the same story of the surveys that I've mentioned to you before. A more individualistic society, a less collectivist society. Now I've got to say, if you told most of the stuff about community to 25-year-old Andrew, he would have said, so what? Social capital is a, a, bit of a, a bit of an issue for middle-class engagement. It's not really something that I, as a social justice warrior, care about. I care about egalitarianism and inequality, uh, not about this soft stuff about how many people are joining groups or how many friends they have. But uh, Bob Putnam's persuaded me that inequality and community aren't two distinct issues. They're actually two sides of the same coin. And that if you look at the trends in a lot of advanced countries, the period in which countries become more equal also tends to be the periods in which their strength of community uh, becomes stronger. Uh, and the period in which community bonds have frayed is also the period in which inequality has risen. Both of these are we versus me problems. Both of them track together. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the rise in inequality the fact we've gone from no Australian billionaires in 1986 to 137 Australian billionaires today also tracks the decline in civil, civil society. And so I'd argue that progressives ought to be engaged in the, the issue of the decline in community. I've been fortunate enough to get the portfolio of charities minister after the election and I'm basically treating that as a community building portfolio. Uh, much to the shock of some of the boffins in Treasury, well, we've been organising building community forums around the country. Uh, we had a big one in Albert Hall uh, there yesterday, uh, and we've had uh, six others in state and territory capitals. I'm bringing together charities to talk to them about the sort of problems I've talked to you about tonight. Uh, the challenge that we're facing with the strength of community in Australia and, and what I think we need to do to turn that around. There's a few things that government can do. First of all, lay off the war on charities, which was running for the last nine years. Uh, we don't have a bloke running the Charities Commission uh, who made his name as a charities critic. That's a pretty good start as well. And we've got an open and transparent search on for a new head of the Charities Commission. Uh, we've said clearly that charitable advocacy will be welcomed and that we want charities to participate in the public square. The Australia Institute's been part of an important conversation over recent years, pushing back against the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government approach that said that charities should be seen and not heard. It's all right to serve soup, soup in a soup kitchen, but for goodness sake, don't talk about poverty. It's all right to plant a few trees, but no, no, don't go talking about deforestation and climate change. It's all right to serve clients through a community legal centre, but don't give us your views on law reform. That view is fundamentally misguided. It underrates charities, it underrates the people who give to them, and it, it does a disservice to our democracy. So we're welcoming chari charitable voices in the public square. Uh, we're also working on a charity blueprint and engaging uh, with the sector through these building community roundtables uh, and uh, an ongoing expert panel. Uh, we're also looking for new ideas from charities. I've been really struck at the number of clever charities that are bucking the trend. Uh, uh, Organisations like Parkrun that are growing and at the time when other community activities are shrinking. Uh, groups like Puddle Jumpers which are managing to attract a whole lot of recruits when others are, are struggling. And I'm keen to share some of those ideas. Uh, the way they're allowing people to tick two boxes in their charitable activities. One of my favourites is uh, Greening Australia's singles tree planting events held on the 14th of February. Uh, which allow you to both deal with deforestation and potentially meet the love of your life. <laughs> What's clever about these sorts of things and, uh, is that they're able to, uh, to uh, find a space in busy lives. And as people get busier, I think we do need to envisage new ways of building community. Now, there's unconventional forms like the mutual aid groups that sprung up during COVID. There's online engagement. Uh, such as the, the Kindness Pandemic page, which shared stories of, of collaboration uh, and cooperation within communities. So I think there's a bit the charity sector can do. I think there's a bit that government can do. But this is really, in my view, a job for all of us. 
And I want to make sure that the community building agenda is seen as inherently a, pro a progressive agenda. It is really important to me uh, to persuade people who have the same views that I had when I was 25 years old uh, that community is not someone else's problem. That getting engaged with a local sporting group, that giving money to, money to charity, uh, such as the Australia Institute, if you're thinking about a, a good cause, uh, that uh, giving back to your community is fundamentally part of the progressive project. This isn't an issue where government needs to step back and so we can have the charity sector step forward. This isn't David Cameron's big society. Uh, this is a progressive agenda which allows government and the community sector to work together to build the kind of society that is, involves us having more friends, more groups uh, and more engagement with our neighbours. The kind of society in which people are able to pitch in and in which we see a responsibility for help, helping out uh, those, those in our street. The kind of society where we have a strong and activist government looking to solve social problems. But we also see it as our own responsibility if we see uh, kids in the local, st local street who look as though they not, might need someone to chat to, in which we're out there volunteering and giving our time and engaging in the community. Uh, there's a lovely distinction between CV virtues and eulogy virtues. The CV virtues are the, the honours and awards we get, uh, the prizes, the salaries, all those sort of status markers. Some of those things that uh, uh, those who are uh, uh, in, uh, in my uh, building up in Parliament House uh, seem to care an awful lot about. And then there's the eulogy virtues. They're the things that people will talk about when we're lying in a box on a stage, li a stage like this uh, and uh, we've just shuffled off our mortal coil. Uh, the eulogy virtues are things like how you treated other people, what you gave back to your community, uh, how, the kindnesses that you showed uh, and your willingness to build a better society. And it's those eulogy virtues that I think we invest in when we invest in community. I think there's a great opportunity to reconnect Australia and build a stronger society and very much look forward to hearing your ideas and working with you on that project in the years to come. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for that. There's a lot to unpack there. Alone, friendless and not knowing our neighbours kind of paints quite a dire picture. Um, but I was really struck by uh, the fact that inequality we know at the Australia Institute is bad for economic growth, but the idea that that's bad for community growth and community connectedness as, as well. Um, can you just unpack that a little bit more? Is it that people who are struggling to make ends meet don't have the, the time or the capacity to be in those types of organisations? How can resolving inequality help connect us more? Yeah, it's a great question, Ebony. I, I mean, I think part of it is about ensuring that people have the time to give back to their communities. Uh, it is interesting now that it's uh, uh, almost 50 years since we had the last major campaign on working hours, uh, and uh, we are uh, in a world in which a range of other advanced countries have more weeks of holiday than us. So one way in which we might be able to have more time for community uh, is through allowing, uh, is through uh, having a conversation around the number of weeks of holidays we have. Uh, another way would be through truly flexible work. Not the kind of flexible work that means your boss can use the time scheduling app to pull you in at, uh, when it suits the, uh, the market demand, but the kind of flexibility that allows people to combine caring activities with work or allows someone to have a good hobby and balance that with work, or allows them to ha spend a day a week volunteering for the Australia Institute uh, and still be on a, a good career traje trajectory. Uh, that workplace flexibility, I think, is, is uh, enabled by strong, stronger unions and by having uh, a, a, a greater worker say uh, and getting the, the power balance right in the workplace. That's good for inequality and, and Good for community too. Uh, you also mentioned the fact that it was in the post-war years that kind of drove that initial joining of things, um, the community connectedness. We've obviously just had the Black Summer bushfires not too long ago. We've just been through a global pandemic. 
Uh, how much did the pandemic kind of isolate people and exacerbate some of these trends we're seeing? Yeah, so we'd sort of hoped initially that the pandemic would bring out a sense of community connectedness. And, and it did, I think, in those initial weeks. But then it had a, a much bigger negative effect. Uh, so much in life is habit. People just got out of the habit of volunteering. People got out of the habit of joining. People got out, got out of the habit of coming along to, uh, to, to events. Uh, it is fantastic to see so many people here, to, here tonight. But I know there's a lot of community groups that are really struggling to get back on track. Uh, so restore, fi finding a way of rebuilding that is going to be important. It's interesting to me too to see some community groups uh, turning off the hybrid option uh, and insisting that people come in person because they argue that the value of the in-person interaction is higher. Uh, apologies to uh, those watching on the live stream right now. Um, that's, a, that's a good observation. I, here in Canberra during the lockdowns, uh, I live alone and was feeling quite lonely at points during the lockdowns. But uh, speaking of the end of neighbours, I actually felt like I was in neighbours sometimes. I had my single bubble household and went round. I walked to their house on a Friday night to have dinner and they would come around the next week. So paradoxically, I got a greater sense of community, met my neighbours and that kind of thing. Um, I did want to ask about, uh, if I can, your book coming out next week and sports, because obviously along with religion and uh, charities and other things, sports is obviously a huge way that communities connect, particularly team sports, as you were talking about. But you also mentioned things like park run and other things. Is there anything uh, you could give us a sneak peek of from your book tonight that speaks to that? Uh I think there's there's a lot that we can uh, get out, learn from sport in terms of uh, building a fairer society. Sport's not perfect, but it does remind us that that the notion that we have to choose between excellence and egalitarianism is a false one. Uh, the best sporting contests prize people who push themselves to their physical limits, but also prize a degree of fluidity that we often don't see in the economy. Uh, four of the five biggest firms on the stock market today were there in 1985. Uh, but if your favourite sporting contest had that degree of stasis at the top, if the same, if four, if the same four, uh, four teams had just been sitting on the top of the ladder for 40 years, you'd switch to a different code. Uh, so we do see in sport uh, a willingness to uh, prize equal treatment. You know, teams swap, uh, sw swap halves at, uh, swap sides at half time in order that neither gets the advantage of a wind. Uh, sports like golf have a handicap to make them fairer. Uh, we put, literally put lead in the saddlebags of uh, horses on the Melbourne Cup in, in order that it's a fairer and more interesting race. Uh, so there's an ability, I think, to learn from sport about how to uh, achieve both excellence and egalitarianism. Uh, sport's not perfect, but it's got a few lessons for Australia, I believe. Uh, you've very helpfully led into my next question, which is I, I heard you earlier in the week making those comments about uh, competition in Australia and the fact that so many large firms are still dominating the ASX compared to 20 or 30 years ago. I wondered if uh, tonight you could just touch on some of your observations on that and, and the problem that that shows with how competition is working in Australia mm. and, and kind of how you're looking at that as, as the minister in this area. Yeah, I've been really concerned about the, the fact that we've seen a mozza of mergers but a scarcity of startups. The startup rate has actually fallen in Australia right, since the uh, turn of the century. Uh, and yet we've got almost a six-fold increase in merger volume since the uh, late 1980s. Uh, what that means is that markets have become more and more concentrated. Uh, the uh, dinner party game that you can play with your uh, nerd friends, well, let's face it, we're all really policy nerds in this room, so you probably don't have any friends who aren't policy nerd friends. Uh, sit around the dinner table and ask, uh, how many industries can you name that are not dominated by a handful of big players? Uh, good luck with it. Uh, I come up with a very short list when I play this game with my friends. Uh, so, you know, it's not just banks and supermarkets, it's baby food and beer. Uh, there's a whole range of sectors that are deep, uh, deeply concentrated. Uh, when I was over in the States recently, I uh, met with a range of policymakers who were concerned about this. Uh, Amy Klobuchar, who uh, 
uh, was one of the presidential contenders for 2020, has written a book called Antitrust. Uh, she talks about market domination uh, going, going all the way from baby food to coffins. Uh, both of those industries, the top four firms have about 80% of market share. Uh, and you saw it with the uh, baby formula uh, shortages in the United States, massively exacerbated by the fact that this is essentially a duopoly. Uh, so yeah, we do need to get a, more, more, a little bit more dynamism in the economy uh, and that degree of market concentration I don't think it's healthy for the economy. Yeah, uh, just for the non-economists in the room, why isn't it healthy for the economy? You talked about those supply chain crunches with baby food, but what other impacts does it have? Why is that bad? So a bit like demographers think that uh, we need plenty more babies in order to have a healthy society, so too industrial organisation economists think we need new firms to have a healthy economy uh, and that you can't just sustain an economy based on the old players. Some people say that if you looked at Detroit in the 1950s, you could tell that it was going to fail one day because the economy of Detroit was just dominated by the big four auto manufacturers. And there weren't many small firms in Detroit. So then, you know, fast forward half a century and suddenly the big players get into trouble and there's no new contenders to take them on. Uh, that's the risk we have in an economy that's become increasingly concentrated uh, and where a, sm uh, a small number of firms are accounting for a, a very large share of economic activity. Uh, we'll come to questions from the audience in just a second. So uh, you'll see we've, down here we've got a microphone. If uh, you want to start lining up here, if you've got a question for the Assistant Minister, uh, we'd appreciate it. Um, but before we go to questions from the audience, um, I did want to come just quickly back to the idea of community and how much technology has impacted on people's mm. connections. Because obviously we're all spending a lot more time online and those types of things seem to be designed to keep us on our phones and not meeting up in person. How big of an impact has that been on community connectedness? Yeah, great question, Ebony. So I think we, we hoped when the internet came on stream that it would be more like another telephone than another television. But pretty much now the, uh, the jury's in on that one and we spend much more time uh, passively watching uh, the, on the internet than we do communicating with others. Uh, and that means that the, there's a, a risk that these... Uh, fabulous technologies, the supercomputers in our pockets, are d taking us away from face-to-face -face interactions rather than encouraging face-to-face -face interactions. It doesn't have to be that way. There's certainly a range of, of apps that allow you to meet up with friends or build diverse communities. Now, if you're uh, a, a stamp collector in Broken Hill or a transgender in Dubbo, uh, then the internet does allow you to link up, link up with uh, like-minded souls. Uh, but there's a risk that too much doom strolling can decrease physical interac in-person interaction. And I see this particularly as the father of three boys and struggling with their device use. I'm just so conscious, Ebony, that these apps that they're using are designed by brilliant computer programmers in Silicon Valley using the latest psychology addiction technologies. Uh, they are working very hard to addict people, to maximise their revenue, to maximise the, the amount of time my kids spend staring at the screen. Their objective is not to maximise my kids' social, inter social interaction, uh, it's, to make, it's to make money. Uh, no surprise, uh, the best in Silicon Valley are very good at making very, very addictive apps. Um, can I get a show of hands from the audience who's got a smartphone? And put your hand up again if it's the first thing you check in the morning. Yeah, fair few. What about the last thing you check before you go to bed? Yeah, that's, that's a big problem, isn't it? <laughs> um, thank you so much. Uh, if people would like to down. I'm not sure if we've got other questions from the audience. Please make your way uh, down. But Andrew, one last one uh, while we get people to come to the microphone. Uh, in your capacity as an ACT member of Parliament, would it be good for the Canberra community to have four senators in the national debate? I, I think it would be great. I would love to have, uh, have more political representatives. 
Um, the challenge that would come is that my uh, annoyingly mathematical colleagues might point out that uh, the ACT currently has 276ths of the Senate and less than 276ths of the Australian population. Uh, yes, it is quite right that Tasmania, ah, Tasmania has more but New South Wales has proportionally less. Um, so, uh, so, you know, I certainly would, uh, would uh, argue in favour of such a proposal were it, for, were it to be put forward, um, but I don't know if it has the mathematical heft to get through. Thank you. I can see we've got a number of people. Uh, so just if I can remind people, please make sure it's a question and not a statement and keep it brief if you can so we can get through everyone who's got questions. Thank you, sir. And tell me your name, please. Um, Andrew, I'm Hugo. Yeah, you you ditched me, and I, now I have Alicia as my member. But either way, I'm a winner. <laughs> Moving on. In in your excellent speech, you mentioned we now have is it 137 billionaires, and that that's directly linked to inequality. Can you explain how the Albanese government can afford to give tax cuts <laughs> to billionaires, and at the same time advocate for community con connection and equality? Thanks, Andrew. Over to you. Very good. I'm, I had anticipated the question would come up, and I'm delighted it to start, to, to start off with it. Um, we can have a reasonable debate about whether or not the tax cuts are well targeted and whether or not they should have gone through the parliament. But for me, the question now is, do you want to go to the Australian people and break a signature election promise? Uh, we've had nine years of a government which uh, broke promises like plates at a Greek wedding. You know, the Morrison government promised an integrity commission before the 2019 election, completely failed to deliver on it. The Abbott government uh, prom uh, promised no cuts to health, no cuts to education, no cuts to the ABC, and then just broke all of those promises in its 2014 budget. And that fundamentally breaks faith with the Australian people. Uh, what we have is, is a, a real crisis of trust in government. Uh, those numbers were going into, into the toilet just before the election. Now they've turned around now, and that's important not just for uh, the government of the day. That is important for those of us who believe that government has a powerful role in solving social problems. When people think that government is broken, that democracy is broken, then they're much more likely to turn to the party that, uh, of, of small government. Uh, remember Ronald Reagan, you know, government isn't, isn't the problem, isn't the solution, government's the problem. That's the sort of approach people take when they say, well, you can't trust politicians. They'll say one thing, do another, they'll break their promises. So keeping our promises is fundamental to ensuring the, the health of the democracy, to restoring the strength of the democracy. And I think for us to break this promise would be an enormous mistake. Uh, there's a lot of people who think we should break, the, break that promise. Uh, there's certainly people who feel passionate about it. No one feels more passionate about it, though, than Peter Dutton. Peter Dutton would dearly love us to break this promise because it would allow him to campaign for the next three years in the same way as Tony Abbott campaigned on the issue of carbon, uh, carbon, uh, the carbon tax. Um, so make no mistake, it would have big implications for how the government was viewed and for people's faith in democracy. Hi, Andrew. Uh, my name's Hannah. Um, you spoke about some kind of negative and concerning trends that we've seen over the past decade since post-war, um, but there's also been, I think, in particular one really positive change, which has been the opportunities and rights afforded to Australian women and the greater, greater equality, gender equality in our country. But I think it's interesting looking at community engagement and volunteering. I've often seen that as being quite a gendered thing and that my dad coached the soccer team, but my mum volunteered at the tuck shop. Grandpa was on the woodworking club, but my grandma was in the CWA and um, I'm wondering if you in your research have come across any trends related to gender and that kind of community engagement as well as what community organizations look like in our now wonderfully totally gender uh, gender equality utopia. <laughs> uh, thanks Hannah, great question. Uh, yes, the 50s were more sexist, racist and homophobic than today. I do not want a bunch of the uh, socially retrograde attitudes which prevailed in that era to come back. Uh, and one of the interesting things that's, go that's gone on is that 
the uh, higher levels of gender pay discrimination in the 1950s meant that we had uh, many women locked out of professions such as uh, uh, dentistry, law, medicine, the public service. And all of those occupations suffered and Australia suffered as a result of locking out that talent. Uh, many of those talented women then worked in the community sector and worked as, as volunteers. Uh, and so the challenge now is not to bring back those retrograde social attitudes, it's to try and build community uh, in an environment in which there is less, though of, of course not no, uh, gender pay discrimination. Uh, that's uh, a challenge, but I think it's one that's, uh, the, that we can, uh, we can tackle. Thank you. Uh, my name's Nancy. Thank you very much for your talk, Andrew. Thank you, Ebony, for uh, organising these things. And for what it's worth, which is nothing at all, I did work in a company in Detroit that didn't have anything to do with the car industry. Oh, no, and it's now gone, and the factory where I worked is now upmarket housing. Wow. <laughs> but that's not my question. Um, there are people who say, and we always wonder, what should the charity world be, be working on? How much of what charities are doing now is actually something the government should be providing, and they're only stepping in because there is no government support for it. So I'd like to know what you think the balance should be. Are there areas where charities are doing more than they should now? Are there areas where the government's doing more than it should, doing less than it should? What, what uh, is your view on that? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Nancy. I think it's, it's always an interesting question to work out where those lines are. The creation of the National Disability Insurance Scheme, I think, goes to one of those core issues, which is that the National Disability Insurance Scheme saw the government picking up a set of tasks which had been predominantly done by the community sector before that. Uh, but there's also a great potential for the community sector to be the sort of... Uh, R&D division of society uh, rather and try new and innovative approaches. Uh, I'm interested particularly in foundations such as the Reichstein Foundation that's looked to encourage social entrepreneurs and try uh, innovative ideas. Now, my own philanthropy uh, is um, shaped very much through the effective altruism movement, uh, which uh, is a movement that's focused on trying to measure impact as rigorously as possible. Um, through randomised trials, the uh, Against Malaria Foundation estimates that uh, for every $5,000 it uh, receives in donations, uh, it manages to save a life. Uh, the idea that you could save a statistical life for $5,000 is, is to me pretty remarkable. Uh, but part of the way they've done that is to get the cost of bed nets in Africa down to just $2. Um, so I, I'm interested in that uh, measure, measurement piece and, and for me uh, that's one of the areas where I'm excited by what charities can do uh, but again just to reinforce the desire for the philanthropic sector and the charity sector to do more is not a desire from, uh, from me for government to do less. Thank you. Next question. Thanks Andrew. My name is Maurice. I'm a proud APS worker and CPSU delegate. Um, I just wanted to, to challenge you. You talked about social capital declining. Um, if you think about the conservation of energy, it doesn't get destroyed or created, it gets transformed. So when you think about something like social media, I've got 500 friends. Um, when you think about declining sport, uh, e-sport has increased 11% annually compound per year. Can you talk a little bit about how maybe not social capital being lost, but how it's changed and how maybe we could tap into that in a different way. Thanks, Maris. Uh, the extent to which we should value online engagement, I think, is a, a really challenging issue. Uh, those online communities can be extraordinarily powerful, uh, but there's also a risk that uh, people are spending time online not engaged in any sort of community, uh, but, uh, but engaged in activities that take them away from, from the main game. And I'll just use one example of, uh, which is politics. Uh, I uh, was, uh, was quite influenced by a book by a Tufts political scientist called Etan Hirsch, titled Politics is for Power. 
And Etan Hirsch argues that too much political engagement in the United States has turned into what he calls um, uh, sports spectating. It's people cheering and jeering from the sidelines rather than actually going out onto the field. And Etan Hirsch argues that uh, while it might feel good to uh, post a snarky comment on Twitter about the other side, it's actually much more effective to turn up to a local council meeting with 20 people in the room and try and shape a zoning decision uh, in your local neighbourhood. Uh, or to go and find somebody who uh, disagrees with you politically and have a face-to-face -face discussion in which you try and persuade them. Uh, so I think the changes that we've seen in, in political engagement potentially take people away from, from the sorts of work that you and, you and I would value and the sort of work that's really at the heart of uh, the way in which unions like the CPSU have, have been so successful. Uh, it's that direct engagement, persuading people, talking about to them about why they ought to be part of a union and, and what the union can achieve. Uh, that's, it's harder to replicate in an online setting. Thank you. Next question. Hello, my name is Matilda. Um, I guess a lot of people, my question comes from the fact that a lot of people who are quite community minded um, pursue that in their paid employment um, in the way of like, uh, like for instance, I work with victims of crime in the ACT. Um, I guess how over the last few years with the pandemic, people like healthcare workers, community workers, they've been pushed to their absolute limit um, and they've got nothing left for themselves really, um, let alone extracurricular community engagements. How do we support people who are our frontline workers and who are so community minded? How do we fill their cups and how do we, how do we get that, that system working in a way that um, I guess structurally works and doesn't just leave people medically burnt out, not like the, the casual way that we talk about it, but really with nothing left. Um, thank you. No, thanks Matilda. And I think part of it is about ensuring that there are real careers available in those, uh, th those sectors. Um, I had a, a head of the Jobs and Skills Summit starting at Parliament House tomorrow. There's been a whole series of uh, forums with different sectors and as the Assistant Minister for Charities I held one today with uh, charity and not-for-profit uh, peaks. Uh, and we were talking, it was about jobs and skills in the charity and not-for-profit sector. Uh, and the, well, the key topic of conversation there was how we ensure uh, good, reliable careers for people working in the social services sector. You know, it shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to make a choice between being able to buy a house and working in a job that, uh, that serves people. Uh, working in aged care, working in disability care, working in early childhood. Uh, these are extraordinarily important jobs. Uh, we uh, pushed for a minimum wage increase as the first decision of Cabinet. Uh, we've now made a submission to the Fair Work Commission on behalf of aged care workers saying that they should get a pay rise. And we've been very clear as a government that that will have budgetary implications for us if, that, uh, if we're successful at the Fair Work Commission and we're up for paying those costs. And Amanda Rishworth has said that in the area of social services that we need to have longer dated contracts uh, because that allows organisations to plan uh, and invest in people and the training and the careers in the social services sector. Uh, that's important in itself, but as you say, Matilda, it may also have a spin-off in terms of the ability of those people to then engage in their community, which would be great. Thank you. Hi, um, my name was Aidan. Uh, thank you for your speech. Uh, my question was just about like competition within the market. Um, I found the what the energy market operator has done really interesting. And um, in relation to fixing the problem of market competition, you've sort of spoken about new firms. But I was wondering if the, the model of the energy market operator could sort of be used in a similar sense in other parts of the economy, um, because it is a sort of solution, um, albeit quite a different one to what you're proposing. So the problem with having events like this in Canberra, Aidan, is that you get people asking questions which are based on a kind of deep understanding of the sector. And I, I've got to say, energy markets are not something that I've uh, invested my, uh, my, my head in as much as I should have. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm happy to defer, to defer to others on the structure of the energy, energy market. Um, certainly it's undergo undergoing a lot of flux. Like other sectors, it seems like you want more players 
because otherwise you have a, a sort of hold up problem. Uh, and the challenge that we're facing, you know, one of the things that I've, I've noted is that uh, as the coal fired power stations are phasing out, they seem to be scheduling maintenance at times when uh, uh, it's going to be most remunerative to do so uh, and man better managing those uh, unscheduled outages is, is going to be important over the coming years. Thank you. Yeah. Hi Andrew, uh, my name is Hanan um, and you touched pretty comprehensively on the problems of social media, how addictive it is and the sort, the, how the algorithms sort of have a root in psychology. Uh, as a university student who often struggles to get his assignments in on time, I can attest to that. Um, so I, I just want to know what you think uh, are the prospects of success surrounding regulatory framework for the algorithms that social media companies use, or if that's simply just out of the realm of political possibility for now? Thanks, Adam. Uh, look, I think it's a, it's a big issue. Uh, there's been a rise in uh, youth mental health problems over the course of the last uh, 15 years or so. It seems to start around 2007 to 2012, which is the period where smartphones uh, launch and a whole lot of the key social media platforms get going. Uh, since that period, we've seen a big rise in the share of Australian teens who say they're stressed, rise in self-harm and a rise in youth suicide. Or those trends appear to be worse for uh, young women than for young men, which is consistent with the role that social networks play uh, in teenage girls and teenage boys socialising. So all of that is it worries me. Uh, and I think the... Uh, initial response of you should just take personal responsibility, turn off notifications, use downtime, uh, put your uh, put your phone face down when you when you can and don't look at it. Uh, all of that is fine, but I don't think that's a complete solution. Um, so we've uh, we've asked today for more information from social media social media platforms uh, about how they're helping assist on issues of mental health. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're not just getting information out through whistleblowers like Francis Haugen, uh, but that there is a much more systematic uh, elicitation of, of what, the, what the evidence is and, and what we can do to, to check it. Uh, and understanding uh, how those algorithms are operating and how they're looking to hook young minds is, uh, is pretty important. I don't think we've got all the answers yet, but I think it's a, it's a pretty big problem. Um, and look, one other thing, um, let's uh, you know, throw in a word that you don't often, uh, don't often expect a politician to say in a public meeting, pornography. Um, pornography has completely transformed uh, teen sexuality. Uh, the, move, the, the, the switch from uh, dirty magazines to violent videos uh, is having, I think, really concerning impacts on relationship formation among young, young Australians. Uh, and that's also one of the aspects that, that needs to, we, we need, need, to, need to keep a stronger eye on. Uh, I'm afraid I don't think we're going to get to all of our questioners, um, but last question, I think, here. Thank you. Oh, hi, Andrew. My name's David. Lucky last. Um, you very clearly uh, describe the statistical breakdown in, in community and the rise of, of the individual. Um, how much of, uh, is it coincidental that that happened at about the same time as, as the rise of neoliberalism? Uh, we all remember Margaret Thatcher saying there's no such thing as society. So that's question number one. And just a quick follow up to the very first question, you know, given the economic and social impacts of inequality, how can the government justify not increasing job seeker payments to help those who are least able to support themselves? Thanks, David. Uh, one, of the, one of the aspects of, uh, of social capital that I think is, is in, uh, important for me as an economist is the role that it plays in making markets work well. Uh, if people don't trust one another, Markets work incredibly badly. You can't do business by a handshake. You have to have a contract in which you write everything down. Uh, that makes, uh, that, that slows up commerce. 
So I don't see a contradiction between well-functioning -fun markets and a trusting society. In fact, I think those two, two things can go quite well together. Um, the opening up of, uh, of markets, the process of globalisation, uh, might have had some short-term impact. There is a tendency of people to sort of hunker down in the face of difference. Uh, but I am confident that uh, you know, a more multicultural, more globalised, more engaged community can build a sense of civic society. I don't think that's, uh, that's beyond us. Uh, as, to, uh, as to job seeker, I would love to, to see an increase in the rate, as I'm sure all of my Labor Party colleagues would. Our challenge is simply the, the trillion dollars of debt that we've been left and the priorities that we've set of uh, fixing the National Disability Insurance Scheme, investing in aged care, uh, and making, making sure that we deliver on the, on the promises we've put in place. Uh, but each budget will, uh, will review these, uh, these payments. If we're able to increase them, uh, we certainly will. I understand the case that you've made, that ACOS has made. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a pretty powerful one. Uh, Ebony, thank you. The wonderful range of questions and such a dynamic and inter interesting conversation. So um, thanks everyone for taking the time to come along tonight. It uh, means a great, a great deal that you're here to uh, support the wonderful Australia Institute. And thank you very much to Andrew Lee. A round of applause, please. Um, <clears throat> it's so great to have access uh, to someone like yourself. We really appreciate the time tonight. Thank you all for coming along this evening. As we said, we love seeing you all in person and we really appreciate that you take the time out uh, to come and attend these events and interact with uh, the people we bring. We hope you get as much out of it as we do. Just a quick reminder um, to make sure you subscribe to our podcast, Follow the Money. We'll have a new episode out tomorrow that delves into some very interesting polling we did on the concept of wokeness, a favourite topic of Peter Dutton, who's got a few mentions this evening. Uh, there'll be some interesting uh, findings in that. Uh, I'd like to thank the staff who help put on these evenings, Hannah Brown, uh, Hayden Starr and Eleanor Johnston-Leake. We really appreciate all their time and effort. Round of applause for them. <clears throat> Thanks again to Verity Lane Market. We love this venue. Please make sure you support them. And come along uh, next month, I believe it's the 28th. I did have it written down, now I can't find it. We're going to be talking to Green Senator Sarah Hanson-Young about the latest State of the Environment report. You'll be able to find that up on our website very shortly, but we hope to see you back next month. Thanks again for your time this evening. Uh, we hope to see you again soon and enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you.